Good morning and welcome to the Brookville Presbyterian Church and a happy Father's Day to all. Today is a special service, uh, one of two services that the worship committee has put together of hymn sings. Today will be um, revival hymns and then later on in July, on July 5th, will be a time for reformed hymn sing. Uh, these were all requested hymns that were uh, gathered from the congregation for reasons they wanted to hear different uh, hymns, and today are uh, revival hymns. We thank Dr. Brent Register for uh, joining us with his talents on the guitar during those hymns here today, adding a special little element to, uh, to increase the uh, joy of that particular uh, section. We also thank uh, Peggy Dillman, who did some research, some extensive research, and you'll be able to hear a lot of lead up to each of the hymns to find out a little more of the background and uh, know a little bit about more of the origin of each of those hymns before you get to enjoy uh, singing through those hymns. Of course, a reminder that there is a Zoom coffee hour afterwards today. If you have checked in your email for the link, please do so. And if you have any concerns or any prayer requests, please continue to send those to the office so that they can be directed to the right person and things can be handled as normal. Listen now, please, to Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with clanging cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now join please in the call to worship. God, let this be a fruitful day. Open our eyes to beauty. Tune our ears to harmony. Fill us with the sweet fragrance of your love. Allow these words and songs to rise in praise. May they be a sweet sound to your ear. Let us worship together. And now the word of the Lord from Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever you will, will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Onward Christian Soldiers, written by Dr. S. Baring Gold, 1834 to 1924. In Yorkshire, England, where Dr. Baringold was stationed as curate of Horbury, it is the custom to observe Whitman Day as a day of festival for the school children. In 1865, his school was invited to march to a neighboring village, there to join the children of another school in the festival exercises. As he couldn't find a suitable hymn for the children to sing while marching from one village to the other, he sat up late into the night to compose a hymn, and out of those midnight hours came the lines, Onward Christian Soldiers, to which the children marched toward their festival and to which hundreds of thousands of Christians have marched in the decades since it was written. 
With the cross of Jesus going on before, refers to the cross, born at the head of the procession, while the many banners following it are pictured in the line, See His Banners Go. The music was written later by Sir Arthur Sullivan, and it makes an ideal processional and has been widely used not only in the places of worship, but also upon a great variety of other occasions. While some are uncomfortable with the militaristic themes and the historical use of the hymn, it is important to note that scripture itself contains a great deal of warfare imagery. The hymn itself is a helpful encouragement to believers as we fight the good fight of faith. Other gods. You tell us 
Thus we cannot serve two masters, yet we spend more time focusing our energies elsewhere, diverting our time, energy, money, and attention away from you. Forgive us, gracious Savior, when our hearts are led astray, when we serve other gods and worship them. Here we turn away from our distractions and sin. Strengthen us to set our faces toward your light, to take up our cross and follow you. We pray this, counting on your grace. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richness of his grace. Amen. And now a reading from 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24. Listen to the word of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The Old Rugged Cross, written by George Bernard, 1873 to 1958. George Bernard was born in Youngstown, Ohio. He was of Scottish descent. His father ran a tavern. When the tavern burned down, George's father became a coal miner. Upon his father's death, George was forced to enter the mines. In 1895, across the state in Canton, George attended Salvation Army meetings and at 24 became a minister when he enlisted in the Salvation Army in Rock Island, Illinois. By 1898, he was conducting revival meetings throughout the Midwest, later transferring to New York, where he resigned in 1910 to go out on his own as an evangelist. It was at that time that he began composing hymns. As he was traveling through the Midwest, he was heckled incessantly by several youth at a revival meeting in Michigan. He was troubled by their total disregard for the gospel. Bernard turned to scripture to reflect on the work of Christ on the cross. He later recalled, I seemed to have a vision. I saw the Christ and the cross inseparable. The melody became, came easily to Bernard, and the first verse was completed by him during a series of meetings in Albion, Michigan. Several months later, he completed the remaining three verses in Pokagon, Michigan, where he was leading a meeting at a local church. After completing the hymn, Bernard performed the song in its entirety for the sponsoring pastor and his wife, Reverend and Mrs. Bostwick. They were moved to tears and incorporated the song into their revival service. Bernard first sang his hymn with guitar accompaniment.
Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead, and they were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. When the Roll is Called Up Yonder was written by James Milton Black, who lived from 1856 to 1938. James was born in South Hill, New York. He acquired an early musical education in singing and organ playing and knew many famous songsters of his day. Around 1881, he moved to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, where he carried on Christian work through the Methodist Episcopal Church. He taught music during the week, he was the song leader, Sunday school teacher, and youth leader in his spare hours. In addition to all his work, he edited hymnals. He loved young people and tried to win them for Christ. One day, as he passed through an alley, he met a ragged 14-year-old girl. He invited her to his Sunday school and youth group, and she began to attend. One day, when he took role, the girl did not respond. Each child had to say a scripture verse when his or her name was called. James saw a lesson in her silence. He said, what a sad thing it would be if when our names are called from the Lamb's Book of Life, one of us should be absent. After Sunday school, he went up to his pupil's home to find out why she had not shown up for class. He found her dangerously ill and sent for his own doctor. The doctor said that she had pneumonia and death was highly likely. James returned home. He tried to find a song to fit the thought of a heavenly roll call, but could not locate one. An inner voice seemed to say, why don't you write one? And that is what he did. A few days later, he had the sad opportunity to explain to the public how he came to write the song when it was sung at the funeral of the girls whose absence inspired.
4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a Friend We Have in Jesus, written by Joseph M. Scriven. What a Friend We Have in Jesus was written as a poem by Joseph in 1855 to comfort his mother, who was living in Ireland while he was in Canada. Scriven originally published the poem anonymously and only received full credit for it in the 1880s. The tune to the hymn was composed by Charles Crozat Converse in 1868. The hymn also has many versions with different lyrics in multiple languages. In some settings, the lyrics have been matched to other tunes.
In the Garden, written by C. Austin Miles, 1868 to 1946. C. Austin Miles trained and worked as a pharmacist in Philadelphia, but gave up the profession in 1892 to become an editor and manager at the Mack Hall Publishing Company. He wrote about 400 gospel songs, telling the Philadelphia record in 1940, apparently the church music was stored up in me, damned up by my preoccupation in other fields. When I began to write, it just poured out. In 1912, the founder of Mack Hall, Dr. Adam Geibel, asked Miles to write something for Easter that was sympathetic in tone, breathing tenderness in every line, one that would bring hope to the hopeless, rest for the weary, and downy pillows to dying beds. Unable to think of a theme, Miles picked up a Bible and read John chapter 20, which tells the story of Mary visiting Jesus' tomb finding his body gone, then meeting him in the garden. He recalled that he felt as if he were standing there witnessing the friendship between Mary and her Lord. He thought, this is not an experience limited to a happening almost 2,000 years ago, but it is the daily companionship with the Savior that makes up the Christian's daily walk. He wrote out the words of the song straight away, then joined his family for dinner. Afterwards, he went back to the verses, and in only a few minutes, the tune had come into his head. Paul Mack rushed the song to publication and licensed it to scores of other publishers. It soon became one of the most popular gospel songs in the world. For all of its success, Miles, who died in 1946 at the age of 78, earned only $4 for the song. But he never expressed regrets. I suppose I never thought of money, he told the Philadelphia Record. I just kept on writing music. I did it all hours, at breakfast, in the trolley cars, and in my nightshirt. It just came tumbling out. Sometimes words first, sometimes the music, and often both together. I always felt it was what I was meant to do, and I've been happy at it. A lot of money wouldn't have been made, and wouldn't have made me any happier.
2 Timothy 2, 14 through 19. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Avoid profane chatter, for it will lead people into more and more impiety, and their talk will spread like gangrene. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing his inscription, The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. Sweet Hour of Prayer, written by William W. Wolford, 1772 to 1850. William Wolford was blind. He sat by his fireside in his English home and kept busy by whittling out useful objects such as shoehorns. His mind was busy too. He was called on to preach from time to time in a rural English church. He composed sermons in his head and he memorized a huge amount of the Bible, which he quoted verbatim in his sermons. Some folks thought he had memorized the entire scriptures cover to cover. He also composed lines of verse. A congregational minister and friend, Thomas Salmon, stopped by Wolford's shop one day in 1842. Wolford asked Salmon if he could write down his new poem on the subject of prayer. Three years later, Salmon was in the U.S. and showed the poem to the editor of the New York Observer, who printed it in the September 13, 1845 issue. The famous American gospel songwriter William Bradbury, who composed music for so many beloved gospel hymns, such as Just As I Am, also wrote the music for this favorite hymn in 1861. Stanza 1 focuses on petitionary prayer that responds to seasons of distress and fear. Stanza 2 focuses on prayers of thanksgiving where the singer shares the joys I feel. Stanza 3 returns to petitions, but the focus is on God, whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless.
Let us now join in prayer. Gracious God, we come together from many places today to worship and adore you. We lift hymns in praise to you, remembering the great gift given to us through the faithful witness of those who came before us. We sing with joy the messages we have grown to love, messages that have been sweeter every day as the trials of life have revealed deeper meaning to the familiar words. We ask the melody of these wonderful songs remain with us as we move forward in this time of uncertainty. Allow the powerful truth contained in them to be a comfort to our souls and a call to move forward in life, sharing your mercy, peace, love, and justice with all humanity. Heavenly Father, today we also celebrate Father's Day. May we think deeply of the beauty of creation when in your great wisdom you created male and female and called them good. Throughout time, fathers have been called forward to serve you through the very gifts you endowed upon them. You called Abram to be the father of a nation, to step out in faith to follow the call you extended. Remaining faithful, Abraham saw your promise fulfilled. May all fathers remain faithful and see the promise fulfilled. You entrusted your son Jesus, the child of Mary, to the care of Joseph, an earthly father. Bless all fathers as they care for their families. Give them strength and wisdom, tenderness and patience. Support them in the work they have to do, protecting those who look to them for comfort, guidance and support. May we look to you, O God, for love and salvation, through Jesus Christ, our rock and defender, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Word of God from Joshua 1, verses 4 through 7. From the wilderness and the Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. Battle Hymn of the Republic, written by Julia Ward Howe, 1819-1910. Julia Ward Howe was an American poet and author. She was also an advocate for abolitionism and a social activist, particularly for women's suffrage. She was born in New York City, the fourth of seven children. Her brother Sam married into the Astor family, which allowed him great social freedom, which he shared with Julia. Julia married Samuel Ridley Howe, who had founded the Perkins School for the Blind. Julia attended lectures, studied foreign languages, and wrote plays and dramas. She traveled extensively and has many writings to her credit. She was inspired to write The Battle Hymn of the Republic after she and her husband visited Washington, D.C., and she met Abraham Lincoln at the White House in November 1861. During the trip, her friend James Freeman Clark suggested she write new words to the song, John Brown's body, which she did on November 19. The song was set to William Steffi's ori original existing music, 
and Howe's version was first published in the Atlantic Monthly in February 1862. It quickly became one of the most popular songs of the Union Army during the American Civil War. Howe died of pneumonia October 17, 1910, at the age of 91.